Try to imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. Total protonic reversal. Protonic reversal. Protonic reversal with your host, Kevin Neutron. Broadcasting from a secret underground lair in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A gigantic middle finger to everything that is rock about music, rock and roll, and cover power. The thing is, though, if you don't laugh, you're going to go on a killing spree with shop and nail it. Confidence of a hero or a fool. I wasn't exactly certain which. Could not be more professional. It's all It means something. It means something. You know, that's my take on it. Like, what's yours? Protonic reversal! That's like a science thing, right? Indeed, indeed, indeed. It is a science thing, it is a science place, it is a scientific fact. We are all up in your face. That's right, welcome to the one, the only, the home of the. Protonic reversal. Yes, that is correct. That is correct. Wow, what's up, everybody? Everybody enjoying their uh, enjoying their quarantine? Having a good quarantine? I feel like that's a thing we should ask people. No. It's not like, have you had a good Arbor Day? No. It's, did you have good quarantine? Uh, lots of great feedback on all the episodes of late. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, it means a lot. Thanks for everybody that's shared it out, that's let people know that this is the thing that's happening. The live episodes, too, are awesome it's great to be able to communicate with people in real time and of course we have a we have a treat for you today we do one of my favorite drummers of all time one of the best drummers of all time in my humble estimation mr tail crover yeah man really looking forward to this he's been on with buzz with the melvins he's been on in the 100th episode which was kind of like a speed round where we talked talk to him for like 10 minutes before he went on stage this is the first time he's been on the show as a guest i'm actually really excited to talk to him fascinating fella obviously great drummer uh really looking forward to that just to get the business out of the way if you are interested in getting the episodes quicker some people have asked about the episodes with andy connors or Stephen mcdonald those are up if you're a patron so that's at patreon.com slash protonic reversal dollar a month twelve dollars a year to get the episodes immediately uh, otherwise, they're just starting to come out now uh, in a more staggered manner. Not compulsory. Uh, no ads, no sponsors ever. That's Kona Neutron, promise. But yeah, if you want to get the episode sooner, dollar a month. Not that big of a deal. Okay, so let's hear a tune, and then we'll come back to Mr. Dale Crover. This is a <laughs> conflict of interest alert, everybody. This is on a split 7-inch on protons and electrons, it's the Del Crover band with a Who medley called Sell Out off of the record The Who Sell Out. Get it? One, two, three, four! <laughs> Darling, I said, what's for tea? What's for tea, daughter? More music, more music, more music, more music. I dance with Linda. I dance with you. I dance with Cindy. Then I suddenly see Mary Ann with a shaky head. What they've done to a man, those shades. Yeah. 
Oh, that was a Dale Crover band with Sell Out. And on the phone right now, we have another than Mr. Dale Crover. Hi, Dale. Hey, Cody. <laughs> How you doing, How's man? How's going? quarantine life? Great. Have you have you done all the crosswords in the house and repainted the garage and all of the normal things that? Uh... Well, I've been thinking about all those things. <laughs> You know, like, yeah, I serious should consideration. This. Yeah, <laughs> I should probably clean up and start that book, and, and and yeah, do all those things that I've always planned on doing, but never had time to do. Write you know, the great the American the novel world. or something like along those lines. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Things are going well, just fine. Been watching lots of movies and uh, playing poker, things like that taught my son how to play uh texas hold'em yesterday oh nice you train your little card shark you can get him <laughs> yeah he, he will be for sure he'll he, he's really good at like monopoly he'll own everything and uh he'll he'll, he'll win <laughs> right <laughs> he'll break you he'll bankrupt you like uh what is the uh the, in the rocky movie with dolph lundgren i will break you except with poker instead yeah yeah <laughs> But it's funny that he's interested in it, you know. He's 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 only eleven. That is kind of hmm. Is that is that atypical for today's kids? I don't know. I don't I don't know anything about it. Like I don't. It, I don't they think have those... so. No, he was talking about card counting and going to Vegas. Wow. I mean, they have those those shows. <laughs> they have those shows uh, like the the World Series of Poker and all that. So I guess it's not like uh, the ordinary, right? Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. No. No, I like the card counting part, though. You know that that seems uh, that, that'll that'll do better for him. I think. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good path, solid. Uh, so we played the <laughs> in the holy conflict of interest alert. We played the uh, the Who medley uh, that's on that protons and electron split that you guys yep. did, where you took uh, the Who sell out and did your did your like Who concentrate version of it, which is badass and that's uh, right, quite well, inventive. A, a little medley. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Were you surprised by it? I was very surprised, especially because you didn't tell right. me what you were doing. But I was like, "Oh, that's cool." Right on. Right. Yeah. That's that's. And people people know that that's a split record between the Secret Friends and the Dale Crover Band. Yeah, I would imagine people that listen to this show know. If if not, yeah, that's uh, Conan Neutron, the Secret Friends, Protons and Electron series. It's Adam Twelve. It's on like Spotify and iTunes and YouTube and all the normal things that things are on. But it's a split seven inch, and then there's a co- uh, LP compilation and CD compilation. Basically, any way you want to listen to it, you can get to that. And that's the last in the series, a series of twelve. That's right. You give me plenty of time to think about it. And what did <laughs> I do? A cover song. <laughs> think exactly. <laughs> Your words. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was one. I don't, know, I don't know if you told you or not, but Bob Weston, who mastered it, was like. It's like holy crap! The Who medley is great. Like he like took a special time, like emailed me specifically with no other business other than tell me how much he liked it. So yeah, yeah, he sent me a really nice note too, saying how much he liked it. So I thought that was really cool. It's it's so funny because there's also people that are like, "That's such a weird song, man." Yeah, for sure. <laughs> All of them, you know. I mean, that, and, well, what a great record to begin with. You know, that's a really great Who record. Possibly that one's my favorite. I think as far as studio records go. Of theirs, right, and and there's it almost plays like a compilation on the record too, because it just you have all these different kinds of songs like sticking together. I mean, the whole point of it, of course, for those that maybe are less familiar with the Who Sell Out, is it's kind of like a mockery and celebration of like advertisements and commercials. Lampoon, maybe is the best word. I don't know what the best. Word yeah, is. exactly, exactly. So yeah, and if you don't know that Who record, uh, that's a really good one to uh, check out. No, you have plenty of time while you're sitting around doing nothing. Right, exactly. Yeah, turn this show off and go listen to that. <laughs> well, after the show. Yeah, yeah after the show. You have plenty of time. You've got time there. for both. Exactly. You've got, you got the, time for both. You got the time. You got the time. So is it is it an interesting situation being on a split seven inch with yourself on the other side? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I've done that before, actually. Yeah, I, I was going to ask because you know you, you've done a lot of stuff in the past. Like you have the, you know, you did that that drum, the thing for Joyful Noise with like the you you, you drop the needle in the different places for the different uh, for the different songs. Exactly the the, the crazy uh, um, the, the grooves are are, are uh, uh, well. There's there's different spindle holes for the thing. If you can picture this, there's like yeah. six different spindle holes across the uh, the vinyl so wherever you put that spindle hole there's going to be a song that goes there so and there's a new one coming out oh really um, it'll be out yeah it'll be out later this month 
through Joyful Noise as well. Same sort of deal, a little bit different, but, you know, kind of a different concept. And, and it's it's going to be this crazy packaging that's all see-through. And, and uh, yeah, it'll be pretty cool. Yeah, I, I so, guess what, what I did is I said drop the needle anywhere, which will literally be any record. But what I meant to say is, yeah, there's the different holes, <laughs> the different special exactly. holes that you put them in, which exactly. makes that unique. Right. It doesn't look like it'll play. <laughs> yeah, you're sure like, what is, is, was this like, did a kid get to this with a drill? Like, what what happened? Yeah, yeah, right, right. But yeah, um, this, this is, this is going to be the first, this is the first time you've been on a split with yourself on the other side, because of course, again, as people listen to the show, I'm just going to assume, no, you play drums uh, for my songs for Conan Neutron, The Secret Friends. That's and, right. I'm, I'm your studio drummer. Yeah, exactly. You're, and, and people get very confused because, of course, the lineups, they have different, there's different people that play. It's always Tony. It's always myself. And there's a bunch of different, t- very talented people that play with us live to help us create a live vision for the songs that I wrote and that we recorded. The Dale Crover band, the record with Bad Move on it, it was just under Dale Crover, right? It wasn't under the Dale Crover yes. band. But you, right. you took the Dale Crover band's sobriquet, if you will. When you did that tour, we had Mindy playing drums and Steve McDonald, right. Toshi. Well, the deal was, the deal was, is I made that record and then I went, gee, I wish I could play this stuff live now. <laughs> so that's the problem I, with making uh, a good record. That, exactly. That's because <laughs> you're like, oh, yeah, yeah it'd well, be cool to play this live. Yeah. I mean, I didn't really know that that's what I wanted to, you know, that, that wasn't the plan when I made the record, you know, and then afterwards I'm like, yeah, you know what? It'd be fun to play live, so that's when I put the band together, and so yeah, so that Who medley is, I guess, kind of the first thing that we recorded together as a band. Though, on the on my first solo record, you know, Steve plays on it, and so does Toshi. Um, but um, you know, this was Mindy's first thing. Right. So, and then and then um, I've got a new solo record in the can that will come out hopefully later this year. As long as we're all still living. Yeah, I was going to say, as, as, um, <laughs> assuming everyone lives, then look forward to that. Yeah. yeah. And so all those guys play on it in, in, in various different forms. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I'm sure. And, and that's something where, of course, you know, even if you play drums, you're playing drums on the record and you're playing guitar and doing vocals, it's a little bit difficult to do all those at the same time unless you're Bob Log or something. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So those shows, you know, obviously it's a it's a, di- a different vibe from from the Melvins, and but you're not a stranger to being a frontman. I mean, you've played in Altamont for all those years, which is great. Yeah, long time, long time. Thank you. Since since uh, like '94 mm-hmm. is when we formed. So yeah, and with that, I just wanted to start a band where I, I played guitar, <laughs> something different. You know, yeah. I've, I've, I'm a long time guitar player. Guitar is actually my first instrument, so you know, it's it's fun, fun for me. Fun time. Yeah, and that's something where because you're known for your drumming, that might be you know what's what's the what's the joke that you know what's what's the best oh, yeah. in a band, <laughs> right? And the well, drummer you know, guitar. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, with the with the pandemic going on, you might want to check on your drummer friends because <laughs> a lot of them are going to come out of this thinking that they can play guitar and sing and write songs. You know. You know, this isn't that. This isn't that hard. This is pretty easy. <laughs> yeah. Shut up! Yeah, it is. <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> you don't think about the side effects of a global pandemic, but there's going to be a four hundred thousand percent increase in solo records that come out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there already is. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, not exactly. I guess we didn't need a pandemic for that, did we? Right. Right. Well, yeah. Um, Anyway, yeah. Anyway, that's yeah. that's 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 depressing. So okay, uh, <laughs> can you can you talk about the thing you were doing with the, the mud honey guys, or is that still sure. a big secret? No, no. We um we uh, talked to those guys a while ago about just coming down and and well we've done we've done a few things like this where we've had friends come into the studio and and just come and record with us. Um, we did it with Flipper. Yep. And had hot a fish. little EP that came out. Yep, Hot Fish that hot came out great. Fish. Love that tune. <laughs> We've done some stuff with some other bands as well. Uh, Helmsley, we did some stuff with them, and that, wow, that'll come out eventually. Uh, we need to finish that. <laughs> uh, we've got it started though. We've already recorded with them, but um, we need to do a little more work on it. But uh, anyway, yeah, we had the Mud Honey guys come down um, just uh, not that long ago, end of uh, February, and um, you know the idea was that we were going to 
do do an EP and do uh, a couple cover songs and see if we could write a couple songs together. And we did, and it, and it went really well. The writing process for those guys was really easy. They came in with something kind of mostly done that we could work on and and, and uh, make a song out of. And then, um, you know, we had a couple things as well. And, yeah, it came out great. And um, it's, you know, already in the works and coming out hopefully soon, you know, within hopefully, hopefully uh, this year sometime. But we liked it enough to where we're hoping that we can get back together and do some more, you know, because it was really fun, uh, really easy to work with those guys. We've known both Mark and Steve for a long time now. Yeah, it's not like they're new new characters on the scene necessarily in, in, in regards to, you know, what you guys do versus versus them. Like there's... I mean, right. Mark even right. did. Uh, he sang the that cover on the Everyone Loves Sausages. That's right. Yeah, uh, scientist songs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, so we've actually done some stuff with him before. So this was uh, with Steve Turner as well. Yeah, Steve so, yeah, is like what? A, like what, sorry to interrupt, but what? What a great guitar player! I, f- I freaking love yeah. the way that guy plays guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. It, um, Totally. <laughs> it was really great. It was really easy to work with those guys. Well, I, I won't give too much away, but we, we did an absolutely brutal cover of My War by Black Flag that yes. uh, I was just listening to the other day. And, and, and uh, sounds really great. You know, I, I'll be excited for people to hear this stuff. That's awesome. Well, yeah, I'm excited that it has happened at all. So when you're, when you're doing a collaboration like that, because you did, like you mentioned, uh, the Unheard one with Helmsley, the stuff with Flipper... Yeah, and then, well, I suppose it that merits its own discussion. The Crystal Fairy record, also, yeah. when it's not just you and Buzz doing it, right? What? How is the process process different? Like making room for other voices? Oh, you mean songwriting together? Yeah. Um, well, we're pretty easy to work with, and uh, um, we're very open minded, and I mean it just. It, it's just like w- w- even with all those things you know like the crystal fairy stuff stuff we did with terry stuff with these mud honey guys and you know uh, helmsley as well it's just really easy and really natural and fun you know <laughs> well you're picking bands that, that are all have people that are very creative in a lot of cases you know you know them from touring or music or life or whatever so th- it's not like you're starting from zero with some people you've never met necessarily yeah mostly yeah yeah, most everybody that we, we are people that we've known and you know kind of thought about. Oh, it'd be fun to do something with them. You know, um, we've done a shitload of records at this point, <laughs> and and for us, it's it's uh, it's fun to do some different stuff and collaborate with different people and it makes it interesting. You know, it makes life fun. Right, and it, it it definitely spices it up when you basically crank out like a record every like year. <laughs> year and a half you can kind of <laughs> get some different stuff out of it right yeah for sure for sure um we do a lot of recording uh, all the time we don't really uh, uh waste anything <laughs> we use everything <laughs> talk to me about doing recording versus uh so and, and again of course the sound of sirens uh toshi and you guys have like a sort of symbiotic relationship you know he records other bands there that's where you guys practice as well but you have the ability to record something pretty much at the drop of a hat anytime any place uh, pretty much you know that that makes it easy since we do practice there it's it's um it's not it's not like a normal practice place but then it's not like a professional studio you know it's someplace in between right um but recorder in that situation is just way more comfortable you know you're not on the clock really um yep. you, you know what i mean you're not going and paying for studio time and, and have to get stuff done at a certain time so i don't know it's just it's it's uh com- compared to how you know our recording our first couple records where we were on the clock and didn't have a bunch of money and had to get everything everything including mixing done in four days you know it's a little different but that's the world that we came from you know that's how we started out was was uh, working really quickly and uh, using our time limited time wisely and you know i think that's carried over into what we do now so we're pretty chill though about it all you know yeah and i think that it's interesting that you also you know if inspiration strikes you can just do it 
Like it's right exactly. there. You can just go rather than having to be like, oh, well, you know, in two months we can set aside time to go to the studio and blah, 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 blah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it used to be where we had to be completely prepared before we went in, you know, okay, we're going to go in and record all these songs. We're going to rehearse them all. And now, you know, I'm, it probably wouldn't have worked a long time ago, but, but now we can just sit there <laughs> and work on something until we, until we have it. Usually how uh, this is how it works. Buzz will come in with something. He'll have a, a, a riff or maybe a song almost done. We'll work on it until I have it down pretty good, and then we'll record it right there and then instead of working on it and and frogging the shit out of it until it gets recorded, You know, which I think some of our early stuff was over-rehearsed just because, well, <laughs> we had nothing but time and yeah. no record deal. And, you know. Again, much like right now, you had all the time in the world and... <laughs> To just right, <laughs> drill right. on it and drill but, you know, on, for the, and drill on it. <laughs> but you know, for the Melvins, it wasn't until the Bullhead record to where we actually had songs that were almost brand new and went into the studio. They weren't fully over rehearsed or anything like that. So, which felt weird at the time. You know, it was like hmm, I don't know. I don't know if I have this down though. I've already played it about fifty times. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, exactly. It's it, it's 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 a different way to work for sure, and yeah, it, it, that's something that when you're not used to it, it can be a little bit, if not off-putting, sort of uh, just a, a bit of a shock to be like, oh, oh, okay. And then you know, when you get it, you get it. So it's like, all right, you know, second or third take, you got it. I'm like, okay, right there, right. you are exactly. <laughs> you know, also we don't have to worry about. Uh, um, uh, limited uh recording abilities like you know we've only got two rolls of tape <laughs> we can't <laughs> buy another one because it costs 300 dollars a reel you know yeah we have to get this one because we're gonna run out of tape <laughs> right <laughs> splice right. it together <laughs> so things Actually, are different you have to splice it together the, what, uh, tell it you told me that story uh forever ago uh on stag oh christ the, the first song the one the, the chimey one uh it was like a tempo thing where you had to Oh yeah, had to splice um, two takes together or something. The bit, I think it the was. The bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm gonna get emails about that. I was like, that's like, ah, the one, the chimey one. <laughs> Christ. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I, that was two takes spliced together for sure. You know, I can't remember exactly where the splice is, but it's it was like. Oh, you played the last half of this song really good. Now go and play the first half of it again. You know, right? Just because you know, we started the song and and by halfway through is when we kind of got into the groove of it. So, you know, but I mean, people been doing that forever. Yeah, it's nothing new. You know? I mean, no, a lot of people don't realize that. People that don't really know anything about recording don't realize that. Um, yeah, that's how they did it. <laughs> there's, there's, there's uh, plenty of uh, uh, producers and engineers out there that would record that way. They're like, okay, I really, well, let, let's take uh, uh, Brian Wilson for example, you know. And there's plenty of bootlegs we can hear where he's directing the band, you know, like, okay, okay, we got that part. Now I'm going to record this part, you know, and then I splice the whole thing together. So it's it's n not necessarily one complete take. And if they screwed up, they had to do it again, you know. But he could hear that. He could hear where, where he was going to do things like that. Yeah, I mean, there's that box set that had like all the different the different takes of all the different versions of the songs, and you get to hear him sort of like figuring it out right. <laughs> as he goes along, right. and it sort of gets closer and closer. Meanwhile, you know, the poor orchestra is like, "What the fuck are we doing? Like, what is what's, what's well, okay, right. okay, okay, <laughs> exactly." Yeah, well, he knew what he was doing. He so, knew what he was doing. Uh, then you look at really the cool. end of it, and it's like, oh. Oh, okay, and it, it makes sense, but because it just was in his head, yeah. right? Or like the guy that we mastered with, John Golden. He used to be a um, uh, an engineer, and he used to do you know sessions in the '60s. And um, he was the one telling me that that one of the guys that he worked with used to do that all the time. He's like, okay, you know, he would do all these takes, and then he would, he would write down like, okay, the chorus of this one's really good. I'm going to take from this take. Uh, the two verses and and spliced the whole thing together, you know. Right. And and I was like, well, how did do that back then? Because they probably didn't really have a click track. Like you can put a click track on something now and play to it. And in particular, we were talking about how Blaine. And he said, well, he would sometimes have a little metronome in his ear, but a lot of times he didn't. He just had really good timing. 
that yeah. was that. And that's something that, you know, with, with digital, you don't have to... I mean, obviously, the timing is still going to be an issue, but it's you don't have to have a dude sitting there with a razor blade, you know, delicately splicing the tape of, of, of you know, what a potential masterpiece, and like, oh yeah, what, if he if he sneezes right now, that's that's gonna yeah. be all dicked up. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Oops, I just threw away part of the song. I've, yep. I've seen that happen before. It was like, wait, I got to dig that piece of tape back out of the trash because I I missed the cut. <laughs> right, right. I just ruined a whole lot of love because I, you know, sp- right. I spazzed out. Oh, that's I should so, say that. Oops, sorry. <laughs> that's, that's what my my dad used to say that, and it said, "I don't think that's very sensitive anymore." Spazzed out. Yeah, you ever heard that? that? Not P- well. Yeah. Why is that not PC to say that? No, probably not. I, uh, I think you're okay. Okay. Well, we all know what I'm. You're okay. About. You're okay here. You're <laughs> it's, okay here. It's it's my show. If you don't like it, go listen to something else. Well, you you won't you won't offend this spaz at all. Okay. Good. Uh, so yeah, when you got when you talk about the, doing stuff with Sound of Sirens, you know I've been I've been witness to seeing you do things like punch a drum take, which is incredible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that was a little harder. <laughs> that was a little harder on tape. <laughs> yeah, a little bit more difficult, as it turns out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and a little bit riskier too. So um, yeah, but yeah, it can be done. <laughs> Yeah, so it wouldn't be something where it seems like you guys have a, still have a good sense of adventure with making records even after Christ, how many records have you guys made? Like a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. Yes, a shitload. I believe it's called a shitload. A metric shitload, yes. <laughs> right. I, don't, I, I, I actually have no idea how many. So, you know, I haven't, I haven't bothered to count. <laughs> and it would be wrong anyway if I came up with a number. Right, right. So It will always be something I'd forget. But but I'm always impressed and inspired by the fact that when you guys you guys still do different stuff and try different things out all the time and kind of have that baked into the whole thing of just having a good sense of self for what you know what you guys do and what the band is, but also having a good sense of like all right let's try something crazy here let's you know let's do that let's do an overdub with a weird effect under it or let's you know, compositionally try something, you know, really nutty here that maybe is a little bit different than what we've done before. Sure. And then also working with Toshi Kasai too. I mean, he's really, he comes up with really great ideas and, and likes to try different things and, you know, he, he'll, uh, he'll change it up and not get stuck in, in, into the same way of doing things. So that it's, it's cool. It's cool having him engineer, you know, he's, he's definitely one of the best, one of the best in the business. Can you? Uh, I completely agree. And actually, Toshi Kasai uh, coming up tomorrow. Toshi Kasai uh, Wednesday. For oh, great! Yeah, <laughs> it's funny. It's funny you should mention that, Dale. <laughs> well, so real quick, following that same thread, has there ever been any like wild thing that you guys have tried where you're like, eh, that kind of sucked, or you know, that didn't work, that you know, that that didn't do what I wanted it to do? Oh yeah, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> And but we're not afraid to go I'm like, oh, yeah, oh, okay, try something else. You yeah. Know? Yeah, not not being too precious about it. And, and so uh, that's, a, that's a good segue, too, talking about Toshi, because, of course, he has that Plan D record, of which you play on as well. Wild record, like with the, uh, so it's all these different drummers, and he's got right. like, these synths, sequ- synths sequenced. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. And... I'll yeah. definitely explain it more to you tomorrow, I'm sure. Yeah, but, uh, I was going to say, it, it's a very interesting It's an interesting way to... Because considering, considering Toshi's a very creative individual, he has an incredible pop sensibility, and you know, he's a great songwriter, great guitar player, but he also likes weird stuff as well, and he did that tour with Melvin's where he was just doing more or less improv, you know, uh, synth soundscape stuff with the uh, the oscillator... Pretty much, a yeah. Scope, a scope, yeah. scope. Is that what you call that? Yeah. Yes, exactly. So th- those are fun to stare at. <laughs> yes, I'm sure if, if you are a person that in, partakes in um, any kind of substance. Oh, you don't even need anything. Things. It's just fun to it's just fun to look at it. Even even you know you, you don't you don't need to have your mind altered to to stare at this thing and 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 trip out. <laughs> I, I really want, I really wanted to get one for the, this is a sad story, but I really wanted to get one for the Protonic Reversal Studio. Then I saw like how much they were and it's got a lava lamp instead. And I feel like it was a very poor choice. You could probably get a cheap one, you know, just keep your eye out. You'll find one. 
Um, but yeah, you know, uh, Toshi, I think, kind of stumbled upon that idea, you know, just by accident, messing around with stuff. And um, we do a lot of that in the studio, you know, like 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 stumble a, a, upon a sound that we like just by, by messing around. You know what I mean? I do, and that's that's a nice that's a nice thing to have in the back pocket too, where you just kind of get your inspiration off of something, you know, for that you would never be able to do if you were, all right, we only got five days guys. we got to get, you know, 11 songs. <laughs> right. Right. Well, we've always said that we're accidentalists. So there you go. There you go. So how do you approach, did you, how do you approach something like Toshi's record, you know, doing something like that, like it, versus writing your own stuff? Is there even any change in approach? Oh, I just let him direct it. You know, direct it how he wants, you know. Um, also, a lot of that stuff, too, he'll run the effects while I'm playing. Like on the uh, um, on, on, on the weirdo, uh, weird lathe cut record that we were talking about earlier, mm, um, yeah. he engineered those. And, and what I wanted him to do was, like, come up with some kind of effects on the drums that would also inspire me for what I'm playing. So um, that, that's how that worked out. And this new one that's coming out is kind of the same as well. Um, though we did a little bit of a different approach to it, it's sort of the same. So, but you'll see. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. It's, it's, you'll just have to wait and see. You, yeah. you describe it very well. I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so <laughs> I, we can just have the record. Yeah, just have to wait and see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's. You, we can make a special accompaniment record that's just you describing the record, so they can they can listen to that beforehand <laughs> or afterwards. See how accurate. It is. Right. <laughs> so working on your own stuff versus working on other folks' stuff and taking direction and like trying to fulfill the vision of who the other artist is. How do how do you approach that? Playing with other people. Yeah. Um. Well. <laughs> Like playing with you, for instance, I mean, you, you, you don't really give me much direction. I just kind of play what I think would fit, and you seem to be pretty happy with it. Yep. So that's how that works. <laughs> um, not, ev- not everybody's the same, though. You know, yeah, um, yeah. You know I, I, I do do a lot of um, uh, drum tracks for other people as well. And, you know, I'm, I'm for hire as far as that goes. And uh, I'll get a lot of stuff sent to me with um, the music already done and just a click track. And, and I'll usually come up with uh, um, what I think fits the song. Now, sometimes people have direction on what they like and what they want. Um, but most of the stuff I've done, people have been pretty happy with it and haven't really had to change much. Most people are hiring me because they like what I do already. Right. So, right. They're, they're, they're not know, looking I, for you to... <laughs> They're not looking for a dog in a cat costume. They're looking for a dog, which is nice. That's right. <laughs> in a dog costume. In a dog costume. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. If you mean, if for you a dog a, in a dog costume. If you had a dog in a dog costume and you just put that on the internet, like that was an Instagram account or something, I guarantee you that would be huge within a couple of days. Dog in a dog costume. Because people, you know, people like dogs. People like dogs. People like nonsense. People like plays on words. It's great. That's right. It's all, it's all the boxes, <laughs> man. Ah, oh, we're... we're we should quit this music thing. Get into social media, single-use accounts. <laughs> if only, if only it would pay. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh, at the Nocturnal Habits record. So Justin from Unwound had that record, and that was a record that really well stood out to me, and I liked it quite a bit. I kind of still run into a bunch of people that hadn't haven't really listened to it. And, and Sarah Lund does drums on a lot of the songs, but for me, it was very. I, I can instantly tell which ones you did on that. Record. Right. Yeah. See, that's another deal too. Like he sent me those songs and there might've been some direction as far as what he was looking for. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I just did my thing and sent it to him and he liked it. Yeah. So far, nobody said like, mm, uh, try again. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Could you put a little more Roto Tom in it, please? Well, sure, I can. I can certainly do that. <laughs> How much Roto Tom is too much, Dale? None. The answer is none. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> In fact, I don't. I I only have Roto Tom. I need more. Yeah. I need. I need Roto Toms 
you need, need multiple roto toms to uh, i do to do i do thing. and big ones too i want some big ones not not i don't want those little tiny ones i want big roto toms You've, okay. Yeah, I, was, I was gonna <laughs> say I, I didn't. I was sort of like I don't know where to go with that. Sorry, man. But the yeah. the uh, get you endorsement for Roto Toms, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you guys, you guys have not been shy about using different percussive stuff, though. Uh, you know, and some of it are very, very iconic. Like for instance, I can think of um, the sleigh bells. Are they sleigh bells that, that are on the? Uh, that song of the bootlicker, the one that's uh, the real kind of the oh, yeah, toy, toy, yeah, 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 toy, toy, yeah. That's the sleigh bells for sure. Well, you know, I mean, the, the Stooges had yeah. sleigh bells, so you know, we had to have sleigh bells too. And when you're using kind of like weird percussion stuff, is it like uh-huh. do, you, do you look at just as the same sort of way as using like weird effects and things? Just like oh, there's another tool in the toolbox. Let's see if this does something cool. Yeah, I mean, well, with percussion, usually, you know, that's kind of the last thing you're recording. And that explains why when you listen to all those old 60s songs, the tambourine part's always the loudest thing because that was the last thing they put on the record. Right. <laughs> so, um, but right, usually, yeah, you know, <laughs> right. So usually you're just, you know, you're just kind of enhancing whatever you have for a drum track, you know. Um, not every song needs tambourine or, or triangle or, or sleigh bells, but you know, sometimes those things help. Sometimes the little things will make it to where that just kind of, uh, you know, ties everything together. If you, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Just like, uh, the carpet does for the dude's house in big Lebowski. Exactly. Right. It ties the room together. You know? <laughs> so the, Talk to me. You know what? I don't think I've ever talked to you about the this the Kiss solo record things that you that you did when you the the, the oh, yeah. Dale and Joe and and the reason I think about it is because before the show came on, I threw on one of the tunes from that, which I was like, oh yeah, you know, I like this a lot. This is this is really cool, but I don't think about it too much. How did that? How did that come to pass? I don't think I ever asked you. Well, it was a, a dumb idea that we had to do solo records that were just like Kiss. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it is a little self-explanatory when you say it that way, sure. <laughs> right. Well, you know, I mean, obviously it's kind of a parody or whatever, um, at least at least with the uh, album art design. But, you know, we, we took those seriously, you know, musically. Um, it was for, something fun to do, really, you know. Um, and... Uh, it, yeah, man. I mean, it was a fun thing to do. Glad I did it, and I that probably led to me doing uh, uh, solo stuff for sure. Were you tempted to put your version of like a Beth or something on there? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I did I did sing that song live one time, really a long time ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was um, it was. Uh, Back when we lived in San Francisco and we were playing Gilman Street, and um, I, <laughs> it was it was a, a, a boombox mic'd up with just the regular version and me singing on top of it. <laughs> boombox and I think karaoke. I was, uh, yeah, exactly. You know, it was it, it was it was it was brilliant, brilliantly stupid. Um, and you know, Peter Chris when he sang that, he would throw out roses well uh, um i i threw out seven inch records because um <laughs> well the, Romantic. the pizza place yeah well the pizza I, I was i was working at this pizza place that had a jukebox and there was a dude that came in and changed the the, the records on the jukebox and and um so he was swapping out all these records and he gave me all the all the ones that that he was taking out and so you know it was like parents trent darby records and stuff like that so. <laughs> Wow, that's awesome! <laughs> Man, I, I can only imagine having the experience of seeing. I presume this was Melvin's, right? This is. Oh yeah, uh-huh. seeing the Melvins at Gilman, seeing you do a juke, a um, boombox karaoke version of Beth, and getting <sighs> having a Terrence Trent Darby seven inch thrown at me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I can't remember if any of them came flying back on stage or not, but, you know, <laughs> it surely confused everybody. Yeah, yeah. 
so talk to me a little bit about you, you lived in Los Angeles for a long time. Uh, we, we've talked a lot about San Francisco recently, I guess mainly because that's where I lived for most of my adult life was in Oakland in the Bay Area. And I've had a bunch of right. people from the Bay Area on. Uh, talk yeah. to me about the Melvin's days in, in the Bay. Well, we moved there in 88 and we moved from Aberdeen. Buzz had actually moved down first and was there for a while. And, and I moved down shortly after and we basically started all over again from scratch you know it was a little bit difficult <laughs> uh, it was hard for us to get shows at first uh, you know like i said like the gilman gilman would do shows um we kind of moved there right and that was starting up and um and it was it was kind of weird. Like, if you played Gilman, what you had to and do you a mop afterwards or something. And, yes, <laughs> that yeah. was the deal. It's like, oh, you guys are playing. You know, Tim Yohannan was like, you guys are playing next week. So, you guys, uh, what the deal is is the bands that are playing, they have to come and work at the club. And so, we had to go down there and like I don't know, sweep up afterwards or something like that. So, that didn't last too long. I think we did it once, and we're just like, eh, oh, fuck this. <laughs> But we played there a bunch, you know, a few times, handful of times, and then we started playing um, at this place in San Francisco called the Covered Wagon Saloon. Covered Wagon, yeah. Yeah, there was. Um, I used to work like Booker. two blocks from it. I, I remember well. <laughs> yeah, it was it was the happening place in San Francisco for quite a while, and the promoter there, Liz, well, she gave mm-hmm. us a chance, and we ended up playing a lot of great shows there. Yeah, played with Nirvana there. Um, um, and, and and a bunch of other great bands. So those were good times. You know, I miss that place. Yeah, it, it briefly became a lesbian bar called the Cherry Bar afterwards, uh-huh. which was <laughs> which they I will say they they finally they replaced the carpet on that stage, which was some, which was something. Which I think that yeah. was the first time that had ever happened since that, pl- that place had been <laughs> around. Uh, but yeah, it didn't. And then it was it was uh, something else, and I don't know, just kind of kind of fizzled away after that unfortunately very sad yeah yeah too bad but definitely that was you know kind of where we started over again and and uh um built up an audience so at that place and at that time you you were putting out records with uh with boner with tom flynn and uh no no actually no um and actually how we got gigs at uh, covered wagon was um through this girl that we knew from seattle named friday she used to be the, the guitar player of seven year bitch oh, um, sure, she's, of course, she's yeah. uh she, she is no longer with us but she's the one who introduced us to liz and then she also introduced us to tom flynn and um was helpful in, in us getting a record deal with him Nice. So that's how that all happened. And that's uh and thus beget Bullhead and that uh yep. and that stuff at the time, you know, you guys were Steel Pole Bathtub was also on that label, great old band. They were. Yeah. Although they, were. they also were you know, from Missoula first and then Denver, like they, they moved all around too before they Right. Right. They were very popular in San Francisco. For sure. Then you know, and this of course being the the early '90s, things things were happening that were different than are happening now, uh, and you end up doing uh, doing Houdini, and you're doing it for a major label. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Um, all thanks to the uh, the um, Seattle explosion. Exactly. The grunge explosion. Yeah. There, there, there was no so. war on grunge yet, so. <laughs> no, no war on grunge. Uh, no, I mean, it was definitely definitely a, a unique time. And, you know, even even if us getting signed, we knew it was kind of a weird thing. And, and, and um, you know, it's something we've never guessed would happen or, or, or really even thought about, you know. So, yeah. Uh, uh, for that to happen was pretty cool. We actually did three records with Atlantic, which was um, two more than we thought would would uh, happen. <laughs> right, yeah, and the and the last one is like the weirdest one, and like one of the weirdest I mean, I think has ever been on a, on, a, on Atlantic. Yeah, um, I really loved that oh, yeah. last one though, and I it's, I kind of thought like oh we you know I thought we I thought at that point we'd made our best record ever, and and just thought like you know that's it people will love this yeah. <laughs> And I was wrong, but you know, <laughs> I loved it. I thought it was. I mean, I, I worked at a record store when that came out, and uh, 
I used to play it all the time to mixed results. Like some people loved it. And just, yeah, I sure. It, and some people were I like, mean, what, is, what is, what is this? And I'm like, it's a Melvin's. <laughs> well, you know, our, our time in Atlantic, we, I mean, we, we outlasted all the employees there. You know, even, even the guy, who signed us who was the the, uh, the vice president was gone by the time we made that record so um it was all new people at the label that weren't weren't really didn't really know what we were or who we were and certainly with that record just had had no idea what to do with it <laughs> i mean it was a bit over all over the map but i mean i don't know i thought it was great i i appreciate you know, the record that i thought i thought everybody would hate it was the one that everybody loved <laughs> well most people um which is the lice all record or what became self-titled i remember making that record going i really like this i think this is really great yeah and nobody's gonna like this at all yeah. well, which was kind of the case but then a lot, a lot later people uh cite that record as being influential in um a lot of things you know um uh, uh i think the whole uh, uh stoner rock scene you know it def- definitely adopted that. I mean, it was a bold, it was a pretty bold record. Like it definitely didn't seem, you know, it didn't seem like you were going for the pop charts with that one necessarily. You know, it was sort of like, all right, here no. we go. first song, here we go. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. We were listening, we were listening to uh, a lot of the Tibetan Gyoto monks back then and the Stooges kind of a combination of the two. Did the, the, the original pressing, you never got in trouble for uh, using the using the name Lysol, right? But eventually they they kind of caught. Oh well, we did, yeah. Well, no, somehow the, the the company found out about it before the record even came out and um, uh, 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 slapped Bunner with a cease and desist order. So, and he actually had to go to court about that record too. Uh, but you know, it, it kind of all worked out. They just had to block out the black out the uh, title and and uh, you know he'd already pressed a bunch of records up <laughs> yeah right. so so he had to basically go in and just take a magic marker or a piece of tape and and you know, put it over the uh, title and so for the re-release we just spelled it differently and that worked Lice out all fine. instead <laughs> that's right that's right because it's not like the Lysol element of it was was vital to the to understanding the record necessarily. It was just you know right. I mean, for one, we didn't realize it was a brand name when we when we came up with it, and you know, for two, I mean, we didn't think that anybody really noticed. You know, I mean, we're just a small small band in the middle of nowhere, really. You know? Yeah, I mean that's because that's one of those things that Lysol. It's like frisbee or you know Velcro or something along those lines, yeah. where it's like you're not gonna say, "Hey, give me that hook tape." You're gonna say, "Give me the Velcro." <laughs> That's right. Throw me the disc. Yeah, throw me the flying disc. People like, look at you from like you're from Mars. Like what? The flying disc? The frisbee? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mark D. Mark Dutram. He recorded you guys before he ever was really playing with you. But then there was right. that time period. But he he, did, he played in all the Atlantic records, including including uh, right. So well, he was involved in our first record label. He was partners with a guy who uh, um, who ran Alchemy Records, and that's how we met him. That's how we met him and Laurie Black. And and when we went to uh, San Francisco to record that record, he was um, he, he was I guess sort of producer, you know, mm-hmm. more or less. For what that's worth, <laughs> sure. And, and it was mostly saying, "Okay, ready, go." Yeah, yeah. You push the button. You know, t- right. tells you like, "Yeah, that was, that was all right." Okay, yeah, okay. Good. rolling, rolling. <laughs> right. <laughs> Play, ends up playing with you guys uh, after after Lori leaves, and. Yep. And plays through that whole period. He plays through the period where y- you actually did, because there's that fantastic Kiss cover that's on uh, Houdini. That, oh, yeah. Uh, Gene actually played that with you. Uh, and I believe this is actually he in the did. documentary, if I remember correctly. But it's been that a long time I've seen it. Yeah. Yep. So how did, how did that come to pass? I mean, it's Gene Simmons, man. Like, <laughs> Well, they were doing their own tribute record to themselves. <laughs> yeah, what? Yeah, and, you can write your own joke here. I'm not going to do it for you. 
I mean, it was, you know, they were picking bands that they, they thought. Yeah, yeah they picked bands one, they I think like, they, and, yeah. and yeah, you know, I, I get And it. probably bands that they thought would help it sell, for sure. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, they were, they were aware of us because, well, for one, we did those solo records. And I'm trying to think. Um, there was a, a product manager that worked for Atlantic that used to be their former publicist, and she's the one who made them aware of the solo records and just that we were fans of the band. You know, uh, we were kind of flying the Kiss flag when it was really uncool to do that. Um, right. This is before they kind of came back full force, right. and people are like, oh right. yeah, they're pretty good. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it was more like so, the. Uh, the, oh, you guys look like that when you take the paint off? It's like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or maybe that um, was just my reaction. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, going going blind, we had been playing that live for quite a while, you know, um, quite a few years before that happened. And, um, yeah, I think that we got asked to record it for the, that record. And I actually went down to uh, – Kiss was doing like a um, – they were doing a promo thing at that, that club in San Francisco called the Oasis. Do you remember that place? Oh, wow. Jesus. In the yeah. middle of the dance floor. Yeah. yeah. Um, wow. Their record Hot in the Shade had, was just coming out and they were doing like an autograph session there. So I went down there with the tape of the song and handed it to Gene. And he was really nice. He was like, oh, and he stood up and shook my hand and he like – goes to the other guys of the band like this is the drummer for the melvins and they've done this song <laughs> right so anyway he was he was really nice and then um i get a call from him i i got a voice message from him saying you know hey this is this is gene and you know i really like your guys's version of the song um you know, I, I'm I, I'm not sure we're going to use it. I don't know yet. There's a we've, we've got way too many songs for this thing, but you know, I just wanted to say it was cool or whatever. So anyway, which is cool enough not, in and of itself. I mean, it's kind of rad that he gave you guys props like that. Yeah. So Dennis R. Jr. had also recorded the same song, and they ended up using their version of that instead. So, oh, <laughs> fine, fine. Damn you, Damascus. <laughs> and so I think that someplace in the press. Um, we had we had said like ah they didn't really like our version of the song you know oh well and I mean, you know we ended up putting it on Houdini anyway since since right. they uh, since they didn't want to use it so we're like well we really like this song we we'll use it and um, Gene caught wind of that and and he he's like that's he even called up he's like that's just not true you know we really like you guys and um, I see that. Uh, that you guys are going to be playing in town in Los Angeles pretty soon. And could I come down and play the song with you guys live? I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> so he did, he did. And he was really nice and, and it was really fun. <laughs> and, um, if you, if you watch the, uh, Melvin's documentary, you can see how his bass got locked into the dressing room. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> when it was time for him to come out and play. Because he, he, because this is a, a nobody show. had the key. Yeah, this is a show where you guys were. Are, uh, we're opening for Primus at the Palladium, in right? Los big Angeles. show, and he's coming out and as a special guest to play the song with you. And yeah, the bass gets right. locked up backstage, and nobody has the key. Right, and we're on stage going, "What the fuck's going on? Okay, where is he?" <laughs> and and yeah, there's footage of him trying to click the the the. Uh, production managers for the for the venue are like just kick the door in <laughs> and you, there's a footage of him trying to kick the door down um, <laughs> finally somebody comes to the key the, the bass gets rescued and and we did it and it was really fun it was fun playing with gene and and you know eventually that led to us also once once those guys did their reunion tour um they actually asked us to play some shows with them so which we were we, we thought that there was no way that that would ever happen but we did we, we played a, a handful of uh shows on their reunion tour and it was <laughs> it was quite the experience yeah the, would, would you say that the crowds were receptive to what you were doing mm, no but they didn't they didn't you know they didn't really care one way or the other you know they were nice enough they were nice and polite. We didn't get booed. And nobody threw anything at us. So it was a success. Yeah, chalk it up to a win and walk away. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, uh, you know, we, we weren't trying to like 
sell their audience or anything like that. We just wanted to play with the Kiss. You know? Yeah, we thought that I was mean, that was amazing. You know, here's the band that it's pretty much the band that made me want to do this and play in a band and play music and and, and do all this stuff. And wow, we're opening for them. That's really cool. So that was a great thing. Yeah, and really fun playing with those guys and and then seeing the behind the scenes stuff and and those guys were I mean they were really nice to us. They were they, you know compared to some other bands that we've toured with who who weren't as friendly and and treated us like like we were lesser the, the lesser uh, humans. And these guys were were nice and treated us nice. You know? yeah. I think that they had been in some situations themselves early on in their career where they didn't get treated so nice by the headlining band. And so I think that they felt that they would never do that to a band. They were sensitive to that yeah. and they wanted to right. maybe, maybe right. You know? go out of their way to make it, make it cool, make it a good experience. Exactly. You know, you know, treat the treat. <laughs> Those guys are big, huge rock stars, but they'll treat you like a normal human being. You know, they're not going to treat you like a, like a, like a, a lesser person, you know, so, you know, people could say what they want about Gene Simmons, but that guy's a super nice guy. And, and, you know, I'll always stick up for him. You know, I mean, he, he was, he was even, he even agreed to be in that documentary. He didn't have to do that. He totally went out of his way and, and made time and gave the filmmaker as much time as he wanted. You know, yeah. uh, th that's really cool. Yeah. I definitely you know? did not have to do that. <laughs> to put it mildly. Right. Exactly, you know. So, I'll defend him forever, you know. And, and Melvin's around nice. that around that time period too. You guys also did some did some shows with Rush, also. Uh, we R did. R.I.P. Those Neil. guys were those guys were super nice too. And that was, a, <laughs> yeah. and you know, just even doing that was like bizarre. Now their audience didn't really like us so much, but you know, whatever. I mean, again, we weren't there to like sell their the audience on our band. We just thought it was cool that we were playing with Rush. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it's sort of like with, with Rush, I'm kind of hard-pressed to think of like what band people would be stoked on to have open for Rush because with Rush, you're just like, that's their favorite band and you're in the way of their favorite band and like, you know, if they're just going to politely like watch your set, then that's fine. That's, you know, that that's a, that's yeah. also a win. Right, right. Um, I would almost think that Rush fans would like our band, but but, you know, yeah. Like you some said, they're, they're there to see, well, maybe some of them, but, uh, you know, whatever, <laughs> you know, like I said, we're, we're, we were just there because, you know, we thought that was uh, pretty hilarious that we were actually opening for Rush. Yeah, man. You know, and there again, some, you know, when I was, uh, when I was, uh, you know, 12, 13 and, and, uh, getting into drumming, I absolutely liked Neil Peart, you know. So uh, <laughs> it was kind of it was uh, another weird thing where I was just like, oh, I can't believe this is happening. Yeah, yeah, this is a, a nice thing. It's like, oh wow, all right, let's just buy the ticket, take the ride, let's do this. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> you certainly developed your own drumming style, and you know, I would I would say, and I have said before that you have a you know a distinct musicality to your drumming that is fairly unique and i think there's there's some other well, drummers that do that yeah, you're welcome uh but i was blown away pleasantly so a little later down the line when you guys sort of annexed jared and cody from big business to do the double yeah. drum thing because because melvins are so you know known to their fans f for such certain things and one of them is the fact that you know you've got you've got a, a powerful presence on drums, and it was so fascinating to be like they're going to do double drums because Cody's obviously amazing on his own. Yes, he's wonderful. Yeah. But yes. that had to be a bit of a trip to sort of work out doing the two drum thing. Like how do, how do you figure out how to compose those parts? Uh, I mean, I guess it helped the fact that you know one of you is right handed, one of them is left handed. So that there's that too, and then also I mean you know we have we have. Uh, uh, Buzz writing songs who um, has really good ideas as far as drums go, uh, helping with that kind of stuff. And yeah, we worked really hard on that stuff, you know. And um, before we got those guys in the in the band, you know, we, we had uh, been been through uh, some tough times with our bass player again, you know. And um, 
decided that we wanted to do something completely different. And that's why we got both of those guys in the band. You know, originally, um, you know, we were looking for a bass player, and I suggested Jared, who my wife is the one who said, what about Jared? And she had known him for a long time. Yeah. And we'd already played a couple of shows as a big business. And when I su suggested that to Buzz, he was like, let's just ask both those guys, you know? Like, yeah, great idea. Yeah, that's so, oh, <laughs> an experiment that worked out well. Like, I mean, it's it's it, definitely it provided did. success in the fact that, like, oh, this is like when when I first heard it was happening, it kind of I was like, huh, and then like I really like took me like a minute to sort of think about what that would look like because I've seen bands try to pull off a two drummer thing, and it's not as easy as I think people seem to think it is. But it seemed like you guys definitely like went over it th very thoughtfully and compose it out and the, and it doesn't you know it doesn't hurt the fact that you know you this you came out of the gate with a super kick-ass group of songs that um, oh yeah too. thank you thanks yeah i mean it's an idea that we'd had before that we wanted to do um even a few years earlier we had we had um we had asked somebody if they wanted to do a tour we did two drums mm -hmm. and um and uh they declined i can't remember why something else going on something else going on in their lives i guess but um you know so it was something that we'd thought about for a while so you th um, you had had the idea percolating in the past of maybe doing yeah something like that. okay yeah yeah exactly and you know just timing it, it worked out you know <laughs> just happened to work out perfectly that that uh we were looking for somebody, and and those two guys from big business were already thinking of maybe moving from from Seattle to uh, Los Angeles. So just yeah, everything just kind of fell into place. Yeah, it's, I love it when playing comes together. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so yeah, you, you did those those records with those guys, and you also have a couple. Uh, records where you, you did the, the, the hold it in record where you have um pinkus and you've got um yeah paul leary doing yes. stuff on there yeah um yeah that was really great i mean we've been fans of the butthole surface for a long time and um we had wanted to work with paul before uh you know, as producer, as we liked some of the stuff he had done as far as that goes. I mean, as well as the butthole surfer stuff, but um, we knew who was producing records and we, and, you know, we thought that'd be really great. But, um, uh, you know, just being able to afford him was the thing. <laughs> so. Oh, because he's doing he was, bigger bands and therefore. Gotcha. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, he was doing like, he did that toadies know, record. You, I know that like was, that was like one of the first bigger bands that, he did i think if i remember correctly well once he was doing like u2 remixes we're just like uh he's out of our league now <laughs> yeah that's as far as a, as far as a, um, you know being able to afford something like that yeah. so you know um we had started playing with jeff pinkus because um honky. yes yeah. honky and paul surfers and um well, he he was playing with us because um, at the time Jared was about to have his first child, right. and so and we had a tour booked, and we're like, it's probably too close to the birth of your child to really go on tour. Yeah, that's not a time you want to be on tour when, <laughs> right? So you know, take a maternity leave, yeah. and and so yeah, I mean you know, and I've known Jeff for a long time, and, uh, both Buzz and I have. Um, so yeah, it just kind of evolved into uh, us having the opportunity to work with, with both of those guys, and that was pretty cool too. <laughs> yeah, he's a Pincus is a very different guy than I expected him being from being a Bundle Servers fan. Like it's just it's like oh you're just oh like, yeah like a really cool, really awesome, sweet dude. Like I kind of expected to be like you know a little bit Uncle Crazy Hill person meth dude. <laughs> And I think, I, yeah, think, I, I, think I told him that and he, and he laughed and I was like, I was like, no, no offense. He's like, no, no, I get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a guy with a good sense of self there. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, great player too. And, and he is, he is for sure. I really, yeah. And, and those songs are really cool. Like I really like that you had that, you know, there's that song that kind of sounds like your version of like a car song or something that's on there. 
And, oh yeah, which is a cool song. And then you have that one that's got the uh, I think Paul Leary on the vocoder. Is that what's happening on there? Like it's it's kind of you can make me yeah, you can make yeah. me wait. I uh, I can't remember if that's the title of it, but that that was Paul's song too, right? You know? And just just letting those guys come up with their own tunes, I thought was it was really cool. You know, yeah, the one that you were talking about in particular that sounds like the Cars. Yeah, um, that was one that buzz wrote and he wrote it he wrote the some of the vocal parts you know with paul's vocal styles in mind <laughs> right I, I remember we recorded it first before those guys laid their tracks down on the on the song and um and so buzz was singing like paul on his part <laughs> right like doing like a paul impersonation <laughs> <laughs> exactly and i was like oh I, okay i totally yeah yeah i see how that fits you know <laughs> Well, it's it's funny, the ones on that album. I, it's pretty funny to play the game of like, which songs came from which people. Yeah, because <laughs> you got that you know piss pissed offerson in there. You know you get to. <laughs> yeah, I mean you can tell that that's like butthole surfers influence for sure. Right. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you know there again, there's a band that we were big fans of and. And um, we we're really happy to be able to do something with those guys too, you know. Yeah. And I think the other time that you're on for the non speed round one, I think it was right right about when that when that Mike and the Melvins record finally came oh, out. Yeah. That was a uh, right. that was a long time coming, man. That was a uh, it was, and you know, I I didn't think that it'd ever get finished just because I I don't know. I just I, I guess I figured that Mike lost interested and in, lost interest in doing it and you know at the time he wasn't really playing music at all so finally, finally i get a call from him one day and he's like hey man i'm thinking about finishing that record and and i've got the i, I transferred the tapes I'm like wow yeah <laughs> so and how how weird for us to finally finish that record it was quite a bit later you know it's like a that. 16 year difference right something like, something like that yeah i mean we had started that record in about 98 when i was still living in san francisco and we recorded at tim Green's studio louder when he was mm-hmm. in san francisco and um it just sat and yeah never got finished um you know and in the meantime we did a bunch of records we'd actually lost kevin out of the band I was mentioning earlier um and then <laughs> there was a period when we when we we weren't we weren't really speaking with each other with Kevin right you know but um you know he was in a bad place and um you know the, luckily he got help for himself and and is you know, kind of came out of it you know um and, and really, came out very creative and vibrant too like the hepatitis stuff is great oh yeah it's awesome yeah for sure for sure but i mean you know i mean uh, finally he 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 basically apologized for for the things that had happened you know yeah um which that's really never happened before with us (laughs) (laughs) you know i mean you know well for what it's worth i mean he's like you know if you guys hadn't have kicked me out and done what you've done i would be dead you know, right, so um, anyway, I believe he said the same we, thing when I had him on, actually, now that I think about it. But I don't know. yeah, yeah. I mean, that could very well be. Um, but um, it was great to finally get back together and finish that with, with both Mike and Kevin. I think that record came out good. Yeah, there's like that. Uh, that's the one, is that, that's one that has that PIL cover. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, Annalisa. What a great uh, band, or at least that classic era of Gale. I, I don't like. I, I got. I got oh, yeah. some, some caveats because there's some pretty crappy John Lydon and the Bros. Uh, well, too. you know, right? Well, you know, the the record that the, we've always said that we're really into, we, we are really into, is that Flowers of Romance record. Yeah, man. And um, just a, a few weeks ago, out of the blue, I got a, a message through Facebook from Martin Atkins, who I've never met before, but um, somebody had told him, I think maybe I listed someplace that that, that was, you know, in, in an article or interview or something that that record was really important for the Melvins. Mm-hmm. And um, he's, uh, he's writing a book about PIL and wanted to know if I would 
either write something or if he could maybe talk to me and, and you know, just get our take on that whole record. So that was exciting. Yeah, that's and, great. Um, and that, that's yeah. a that's such a crazy sounding record too. I mean, Keith Levine's a kind of low key favorite guitar player of mine too. Like that whole oh yeah, yeah. classic era yeah. of that band is amazing. And there's the uh, did you ever see the did you ever see when PIL was an American bandstand? Oh yeah, yeah. I think that's Martin on there too. Or yeah, I, I, I believe so. And 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 freaking Dick Clark is is like you know interviewing them and is sort of you know kind of making it about johnny who clearly wants nothing to do with it and like he like kind of goes around to like introduce the band and he goes yeah. to jaw wobble and jaw wobble says jaw wobble the jaw wobble which, right. I thought, which I thought was the most because he knew he only had like you know like whatever like a second and a half to like do his thing and i always thought that was the most hilarious flex. yeah i think he ends up i think he ends up playing drums at the end of the whole thing too doesn't he i think so I yeah 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 it's been i haven't watched it in a while but yeah, you're listening to, to two rock dudes talk about a YouTube clip from American Bandstand, and it's on radio. That's right. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good one. You should definitely go on and watch it. It's a, it's a big and American Bandstand. That's incredible. Right. That's so amazing. <laughs> but but that record, yeah, that record was was uh, um, is a pretty big influence on the Melvins for sure. I can hear it, and you know, the and flowers of romance, and it's a drummer's record, man. If you're a drummer and you've never heard that record, you gotta yeah. get that. You know. It's, and Martin Atkins is, so, a, is a great drummer just in, in general too. He's yeah, an yeah. inventive, interesting drummer that uh, you know. I, maybe if you only know him from, you know, some of the more straight ahead industrial stuff, you pig face or whatever. Yeah. Well, then, then you know, again, like you know, uh, Ministry they had the two drummer thing going on with both him and and uh, Bill Riflin. Yep. You know, and it's like I I'd kind of forgotten about that. It's like oh yeah, duh. You know, these guys were doing this before we were. <laughs> Um, Ray Washam played in that band for a while too. Of scratch acid, he and, did. Uh, yes, and all that. Yes, yes. Um, he did for sure. Um, <laughs> in fact, they rehearsed in our re- in our rehearsal space with him um, because they they uh, they are on tour and one of their drummers wasn't working out for him, so they flew him in really quick to to rejoin the band and and finish the tour with him. Wow. So they, and they use your practice space to check yeah. out? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I had to go and set up our, re- our rehearsal space for ministry once. <laughs> <laughs> huh. That's, uh, that, that's fascinating. So, yeah, well, what? So what all that? Into? I mean, you, I mean, you don't, you can't separate the drums, you know, necessarily out. So, right No, I mean, they were just looking for a place to rehearse just really to quick, and you know, and we're, we're kind of friends with those guys, you know, um, we're pretty good friends with, with, uh, their bass player, Paul. Yeah. And I think he's you? the one that said like, Hey, can we, uh, can we, uh, uh, use your, your space to practice? So real quick, I want to talk because I got Steven's side of it. Steve McDonald, of course, uh, who's plays bass with you uh, quite a bit of the time these days that kind of started with you filling in on an off tour. It did. Yeah. Yeah. And then he did that bass is loaded record and he's, he's on that. Is he on that? I, I think so. Is I think you're right. I, <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. You're probably is? right. No, I think he is. <laughs> yeah. But definitely well, you, you were just some. doing that. You were, you were still putting that record together when we first started playing. So if I remember right, that's, he's on like two, two of the songs. Oh yeah. Cause he's on that. That's probably true. Yeah. I mean, no, it's, it's like, it's more than that. It's like three or four of them. Eh, whatever. Well, Who cares? well, that record is just kind of worked out where it's like we had all this material with various different bass players, and we're like, oh, five different bass players on this thing. Oh, we call it "Bases Loaded," and it'll it'll be a, a play on on words and our also our love for baseball. So, <laughs> which is a thing that 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 you do love. Uh, the thing that I I miss the most. I was gonna right say now. it's it's there's there's of the many things that are gone. It's like. I, th- I think it became real for a lot of people when sports was canceled. Like, I think yeah. that's when people were like, oh, really? Well, this is all weird because, I mean, you know, the the first sign of anything getting canceled was South by Southwest. Right. Yes. You know? And it was like, that was really weird. It's like, whoa. When all the tech companies backed out first off, it was like, wow. Yeah. Maybe this is, maybe this is serious, you know? <laughs> if If that was happening, you know? And yeah, well. Now we know it was, but it just it's strange that that's kind of how that's kind of how it all started, at least for me. 
and stuff stuff starting to get canceled that was all yeah starting with that. There, there were sort of like rumblings and then yeah when sports got canceled and then well you guys were supposed to be playing at uh in austin around that time did you guys end we up did so we it? got did through it? yeah we got through the austin show and that's but it was a weird it was a weird vibe because it sort of had the like hmm everyone was kind of starting to like look around a little bit and was that pre south by or pre south by southwest and then we got through two dates of of that next run and then like that's we had to cancel the rest of them because like the <laughs> the tour was centered around seattle and it was like yeah that's like the epicenter of all this well then became new york right like, yeah, we're definitely not we're not going to do that like we're going to have to cancel right. these dates, which which is rough yeah yeah it's it's a bummer you know i mean it's going to take a while for things to get back to whatever is normal you yeah, know i think normal is well because you were exactly. originally going to be on tour with red cross right now you, you would actually we were supposed would to be, be in, in europe. yeah we'd be in europe right now yeah right so and nice. we're trying to reschedule it you know and i think it's getting rescheduled but i mean you know everything's still just uh, uncertain. You know what's going to happen if if when this is all when we're all through of this, <clears throat> whether the clubs are going to be able to survive or have survived without being open. And you know it's really going to change everything. And I think you know for <clears throat> for us for tuning musicians, um, it sets us back about a year. You know. Yeah. Well, and it's and, it's hard to tell. Like some yeah. places may not come back; they may not have the ability to come back. They're, they're not going to. I mean, that's absolutely going to happen. You know, which is which is a bummer. You know, God, it's, um, so, it's so. I mean, and it's it's so. The one cool thing that has been by doing all these shows is talking to all these different folks, and it, I've not. I can't think of anything else that's happened that's been such a unifying thing where everyone's sort of in the same boat of just like, well okay here we are and yeah no yeah. one really knows like you have a pretty good idea and especially you know you know and i mentioned you know you mentioned south by southwest like that being like oh that just got real south by southwest closed i don't feel like people took it seriously in wisconsin until they closed the bars which says a lot about yeah. wisconsin <laughs> yeah oh yeah for sure i mean then, oh, then it's, people were uh, like, oh, oh. This, oh yeah <laughs> well yeah because that that's because you know Wisconsin's like the drunkest state nation. Yeah, because because exactly, everyone has a resting state <clears throat> has a bit of a buzz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can see why. I mean, you guys have to suffer, suffer through completely brutal winters. You yeah. know, I, could, I I understand why you guys like to drink so much. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. <laughs> but um, Story yeah. So when did the bar when did, when did, when did bars close down there? Because I mean, here it was like about the 15th of March where they were just like, okay, that's yeah, it. That, that, closed. that sounds about right. Because yeah, we only got to like the first two dates on that run and the last one had been Madison. And that was something where we we're sort of like, okay, I feel like this is kind of riding the line, but the, like almost immediately afterwards, like, yep, you know, no, no, all bars must close order the governor. And it's like, okay, wow. That's yeah. Kind of saw that coming, and it totally makes sense. But I mean, when you think about all the people that, like the bartenders and the servers and whatnot, it's like, okay, well, they can't really work from home, guys. You know that, right? No, no, <laughs> no. We're screwed. You know, we're completely screwed. Yeah. So anyway, the, the nice thing <laughs> about we'll get doing, through this. Yeah, we'll get through it. And the nice thing about doing these shows is that there is that factor that we are all experiencing the same thing. And there's, it's rare in this life now to have that kind of unifying experience where everyone's kind of in the same boat and, you know, kind of feeling the same way, the same way as sort of like slightly anxious or worried. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, it'll take a while, but you know, hopefully things will get back to normal soon. Yeah. We'll see. And hopefully we'll, uh, you know, we'll have baseball back and we'll have uh, touring back and we'll, I think everyone maybe will appreciate all of it a little more instead of taking for granted. <laughs> yeah maybe yeah. hopefully that's what tony's theory is is that when shows happen again people are gonna be really stoked <laughs> i think so i think people are going to be a little bit worried about going out at first but at the same time i think that they'll be really wanting to get things to get back to some what of a normal lifestyle you know <laughs> that'd be crazy <laughs> wanting to go out and, and all that stuff, you know. But hey, you know, you won't have to shake hands with people anymore. Uh, you <laughs> yeah, can, you it's can all, wear it's a mask. Not bad. And, yeah, you can, exactly. Right. You can dress up like you're going to rob a bank, and it's just standard issue stuff, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The one thing I do worry about is is it seems like. 
there's cer certain folks that don't seem to think it's like that big of a deal for whatever reason. So it's sort of like, okay, right. if you're still running around doing stuff like normal and everyone else is taking the proper procedures, this is still going to take a while because you're going to go run around and have your church group or whatever and infect each other. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or you know, I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, for the most part, everybody here, it's, Seems like they're staying home. Yeah. Um, I just I just read a thing today that said that LA has the cleanest air ever. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, no one's driving anywhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Cleanest in the world, I think, was the headline. <laughs> cleanest air in the world. So, um, but yeah, you know um, that that the, the you can do a sequel to that Jello record you did and do never breathe what you can say. <sighs> Yeah, now you can. <laughs> now you have to breathe it. Exactly. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So quarantine life, man. It's a it, it it's a trip. You got you, you gonna got any decks to build or any uh, new new macrame projects or something that you're working on? <laughs> well, like I said, there's there's poker, and I think that there's probably a game waiting for me when I'm done with this interview. Okay. Um, we watched uh, the other day on on TV. They had uh, uh, the Ten Commandments. Oh wow, with Charlton so Heston. We, yeah, nice. yeah. Which I don't think I'd ever seen. Really, I mean, maybe parts of it. It's pretty good. And and, uh, and uh, um, Yul Brenner too, I think, is in it. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's a um, um, there's a lot of things that reference that movie. So it's like one of those things where like you might know the references, but like you're like, oh yeah, it's right. right. Right, right. Um, yeah, and we've been watching a lot of Simpsons, too, and there's so many movie references in there, and I'll be yeah. laughing and, like, trying to explain to the kids, like, oh, this is this movie here. You right. Know, but, <laughs> <laughs> I've, uh, I finally started watching that show Community, which I just sort of missed the first time around with uh, Chevy Chase and, and all them. And uh, No, I don't know it. I don't know it. I had people for, I think, 10 years ago is when it was on the air. Like, oh, you got to watch it. It's so good. I'm like, all right, I will, I will. And, you know, I never did. And so I got nothing but time now. And I got to say, very no, funny. you can watch it. Funny show. Very funny show. The last couple of days, we watched the, the first two Hobbit movies and we're, we're going to get on the third one. Oh, the ones that well. the, the uh, where they stretch it out to, to multi. They, did they really need oh, to yeah, stretch yeah. it out? I even you know I actually haven't watched those. I kind of I love them. Yeah, you got time. <laughs> I, I got time. Oh, if you like if you like the Lord of the Rings, you'll like you'll like Hobbit. Yeah, I don't They're know really what's good. kept me from watching them because I I've seen the Lord of the Rings movies like a million times. You know who was the freaking head of visual effects for those movies is Mike Moraski from Still Oh wow, yeah, I think I might have known something about that. Yeah, he like lived down in New so, Zealand when they were making it, which is right, wild, right, man, right, yeah. Um, but yeah, the Hobbit ones are, are equally as good, I think. Okay, well maybe I'll, maybe we'll go check that out later. <laughs> yeah, for sure, Dale. That's uh, thanks for spending some of your quarantine 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 quarantine. Sure, <laughs> quarantine. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it's a poor man too. <laughs> uh, I, it's it's great to actually have you on, like as a as a long form guest, because uh, I, I kind of feel like as as much as we talk, I don't really didn't really get a chance to have it on the show. So I appreciate you taking the time. Well, to do it. well thanks for finally asking me. <laughs> yeah, you didn't have to like get in by calling Stephen McDonald when I have him on. <laughs> <laughs> Which right. Well, hilarious. we'll have to do it again. Yeah, yeah. And oh, good, good. I I, I missed it. I, uh, are, are are your shows uh, um, archived? They are. They are. I, di I did this thing because I'm cranking out so many of them. Where there's a Patreon now, and if you if you join the Patreon, you get them immediately. And otherwise, you got to like wait about a week for that for they come. Right. Out. But uh, yeah, they they are all basically you get them all for free. It's just the kind of thing where. You know, if you want to like support the show, you throw down a dollar a month. It's not that much, and you can right you get them immediately. And it's not because I'm like think I'm going to go like you know pay rent with that or something. But it's sure, sure. Well, I'm sure it was good. Steve's always a good. Uh, he, he's a good talker. Yep, he's yep. a good storyteller. He sure is. We're, we're, we're a very, very interesting guy. So I guess last thing I always ask people at the end: uh, Why do you do what you do? Well, um, I do what I do because I have to. And I have to because I can. Mm, that's very zen of you. I like that. So there you go. Yes. That's the truth, you know? I do this because I have to, and I have to because I can. That's good. I like it. I stole that from somebody. I can't remember who, but <laughs> but, yeah. but, it, but it is the truth. You know? I, I, I won't tell. <laughs> it's the absolute truth, you know? Um, I'm... I'm, I'm very grateful that, that I can do this for a living. Hopefully I can still continue to do it for a living after this 
is all over. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, things are definitely going to change. And it's going to be super hard, but we'll get through it. Dale Cover. Good talking to you, buddy. Conan Neutron. Good to talk to you, too. Let's do it again. Check you later and uh, stay safe, man. All right. Check you later. <laughs> <laughs> Bye-bye. Right, brother. Ah, there he goes. All right. Let's hear a song. Kicking Machine.
with uh, Brass Cupcake. That was the car sounding one that I kind of rattled on for a bit about. And before that, we had the Melvins with Terry Genderbender from the Butcherettes doing a cover of Bikini Kills, A Rebel Girl. Before that was Melvins again with Dead Wipe. That is off of the uh, solo records they did where it's their heads and they each did them all. So Dale Crover on vocals for that one. Before that was one Dale Crover from The Fickle Finger of Fate, Bad Move. And before that, Melvins with Kicking Machine. Yeah, there you go. That was uh, Mr. Crover. I should have had him on a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, what am i gonna say it's a it's a busy world it's a, it's a crashing of of worlds and there's a good opportunity to to do that and uh yeah it seems like it went well it was it's, it's good i like talking to that guy he's fascinating really cool hearing his take on most things melvins if not all things melvins looking forward to hearing that thing with helms lee that's fascinating that's like really fascinating that, that kind of blows my mind that what that would sound like so let's hear i kind of forget about the records with jail biafra but let's do a halo of flies uh jello and the melvins <laughs> Bye. 
<laughs> there you go. That's all five hours of uh, Halo of Flies, the Alice Cooper band cover by Is this thing Shelby Off and the Melvins. That's on, oh, I don't know. One of those records that these guys did together. It's, it's great. It's Alice Cooper band. It's awesome. Can you hear me now? Yeah, so there you go. It's uh, another episode of Protonic Reversal in the books. Put it in the books, baby. Are we going? The show is called Conan Neutron's Protonic Reversal. It's available. RadioNope.com. Traditionally on Thursdays, 8 p.m. Eastern. Quite frequently these days, especially this week. least one every day this week so stay tuned to radio nope radio nope.com radio neutron.com for the archives as we come to the close of our broadcast day want the episodes quicker farewell practice slash program commercial dollar an episode gets to you quicker signing off Otherwise, always free. No Mr. ads, no sponsors. And Mrs. America, and all the ships at sea. Thanks for this. Spread the show around. Anyone within the sound of my voice. Ratings and reviews and stuff generally help people find the show, so it's always appreciated also. Not compulsory. I've got 50,000 watts of power. I'd like to welcome my guest. Thank my guest, Mr. Dale Krober. I am Eyes the Air. Melvins. Dill Cover Band, Conor Neutron, Secret Friends, many others, but most of the Melvins. This microphone turns sound into electricity. Not hard to find out what the Melvins are up to. Just Google it. Can you hear me now? I think it's the Melvins down there. Out on Route 128, in the dark and lonely. Stay safe out there. I got my radio on. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? to my top 10. I'd like to thank our sponsor. But we haven't got a sponsor. Not if you were the last man on earth. She was prepared to prove it. This one goes out to a special girl. There is no special girl! It's the... It's the end of radio! The last announcer plays the last record! The last what? Leaves the transmitter! Circles the globe in search of a listener. Can you hear me now?
not really broadcasting if there's no one there to receive. It's the end of radio. As we come to the close of our broadcast day. Thanks for finally asking me. <laughs> Check you later. <laughs>